Okay, so we have some pretty big Apple leaks regarding the iPad, the studio display, um, the Apple Watch, as well as some pretty big internal changes within Apple as a company. And I'm gonna get into all of that right after this. So something that all high-end smartphones released today will share is 5G capability. But the reality is that they are not all made equal. Oppo, our sponsor for this video, has sent us the Find X5 Pro to see if its 5G capability stacks up against the iPhone 13 Pro Max and the S22 Ultra. Find out how it did later in this video. And now, back to the video. First of all, I want to address the situation with Johnny Ive. So I don't know how many of you have seen this, but uh, New York Times posted a recent report claiming that Johnny Ive no longer works as a consultant for Apple. So I don't know how many of you have been following uh, what's been happening to Johnny Ive behind the scenes, but essentially his last big product was the Apple Watch. He was very involved with the Apple Watch. That was his baby, essentially. In fact, he was the one pushing for that really expensive $18,000 Apple Watch edition. But as you probably all know, that didn't do so well. <laughs> and uh, because of all that and the reception that Apple got in terms of the more expensive models, which he was pushing, um, he became very discouraged. A couple of insider reports claim that uh, he wasn't actually going to the office anymore or even attending the meetings that he had to. He kept postponing stuff and just not really showing up for work. Essentially, he was becoming more and more disconnected from Apple. And uh, Tim Cook was not very happy about that. Uh, and Johnny was also not very happy about Apple not caring as much about design anymore and simply just recycling products for profit. And Johnny was also not happy about Tim Cook not really being involved in the product development cycle. If you guys remember that uh, 2019 Mac Pro clip from the event where Johnny was essentially explaining the Mac Pro to Tim and Tim was acting as if he'd never actually seen the product. So because of all of this, uh, Johnny departed Apple in 2019 from his position as chief design officer. Now, he did continue to work with Apple through his newly formed company called Love From. His last design, at least that we know of, was the M1 iMac from 2021. And just looking at this thing, you can probably tell that it has a bit of Johnny Ive in it. It's crazy, crazy thin. It comes in multiple colors. The attention to detail is insane. And if you take a look at Apple's other big product for 2021, the new MacBook Pros, uh, there's no indication that Johnny Ive was involved in this design. Like, if you take a look at how they look, they're, you know, they're thick, they have a notch, they just don't look as good as the previous generation. So I don't think he was involved in the Mac Pros at all. And now, that partnership is gone. But why did he leave for the second time? Well, apparently when Johnny left initially, um, he signed a multi-year contract with Apple worth a hundred million dollars. And one of the clauses in that contract was that he was not allowed to work with any company that Apple considered a competitor. Johnny was very frustrated because of that, and Apple was also frustrated by how much money they were paying Johnny. Plus, a lot of Apple designers apparently were actually leaving to join Johnny's company, Love From. So when the terms of the contract ended, they both agreed not to renew it. So now that Johnny's gone, What's his legacy, actually? Well, I think he definitely had a couple of questionable products, like the Magic Mouse and, you know, how it charges. The 2016 MacBook Pro is probably the best example or the worst example, the one with the touch bar and the butterfly keyboard, which he both approved and they both failed terribly. And even the Apple Watch Edition, uh, these are all failures, big ones of Apple. But I don't think that this is his legacy. I think his true legacy is the fact that he managed to unify the hardware and the software team to work together. Uh, this happened when he took over iOS design, uh, when Apple introduced iOS 7. And I think Johnny also introduced a culture of extreme attention to detail within Apple. Like if you take a look at the iMac, um, all the accessories are color matched and the cable as well. And even the inside of the ports, same goes for the MacBook Pros. Uh, the Maxif cable, for example, has an aluminum head, which is also braided and also color matched on the MacBook Airs. And on top of that, I think it's just the overall focus on quality that Apple is so well known for. But okay, who will be leading Apple's design team in that case? Uh, well, apparently it's Jeff Williams who has actually been overseeing Apple's design team since Johnny's original departure. Now, Jeff Williams is the chief operating officer. Uh, his background is in engineering, so he's not really a design person, or at least he doesn't have the background in design. But if he has been overseeing the design teams since 2019, I think he did a pretty decent job. Then the industrial design is led by Evans Hanke. Uh, she's actually the only person with a background in design. And then there's also Greg uh, Joswiak, 
who's Apple's marketing chief, and he's also been said to have a central role in Apple's product design choices. So yeah, I don't think that Apple's gonna be doomed without Johnny Ive in terms of the design, but I do think that uh, they're definitely gonna take Apple into a different direction. Like if you take a look at the Mac Pros, that's the best example. Also the Mac Studio, these are not necessarily design focused devices, but they're very, very productivity focused and essentially giving users exactly what they asked for maybe aside from the price. So earlier in this video, I mentioned the Oppo Find X5 Pro and how its 5G performance would compare against the most premium smartphones on the market. Thanks to its 360 degree antenna design and Oppo's optimization of 5G, the Find X5 Pro has a more stable connection with lower latency, fewer freezes, and faster signal pickup than these other flagships. We noticed that it clearly has faster speeds even when all the phones had solid mobile signal. As you can see here, the the Oppo is ahead of the iPhone and the S22 Ultra. You can also hold it however you'd like, and its signal won't be affected. The speed in these conditions should be great, even in places such as this car park, where you might expect to have a weak signal or none at all. 5G utilization can often go under the radar, and Oppo does a fantastic job here, more than holding its own against the two other leading flagships, the iPhone 13 Pro Max and the S22 Ultra, in terms of its network capability. Check out the Oppo Find X5 Pro by using the link below. And now, back to the video. Now, I have some updates in terms of the iPad. More specifically, Russ Young was on a podcast with Mac Rumors and he revealed a couple of extra details uh, regarding the upcoming iPads. He said that the 14.1 inch iPad, which we know is coming in early 2023, would no longer have a mini LED display. So before we did hear that it might not have ProMotion, but now, uh, it seems like it won't even have mini LED, so it would simply have an LCD display just like the iPad Air. That's quite strange because in that case, this will simply be another version of the iPad Air. I don't know, iPad Air Max or something. I guess that maybe Apple simply wants to test the waters and see how well that would sell before actually releasing an even more expensive 14.1 inch iPad Pro as the iPad Air currently costs $600. The 11 inch iPad Pro starts from $800 and then the 12.9 inch iPad Pro costs 1100 If they were to price this 14.1 inch at, I don't know, like 1500 I don't think a lot of people would be buying that over a MacBook. But if they release this as an Air brand uh, and they price it at, I don't know, 800 I think it could fly off the shelves. Russ also said that the 11 inch iPad Pro is unfortunately sticking to an LCD display for the foreseeable future, which is quite disappointing. Um, I guess mini LED is simply harder to do on a smaller display since you need more mini LEDs and they have to be smaller too. So according to us, uh, both the 11 inch and the 12.9 inch would simply jump to OLED in 2024. And then something very interesting that he said is that uh, the iPad Pro will actually be getting an under the display face ID and front camera uh, in the near future. This is something that we've heard about Apple wanting to do on the iPhone, uh, I believe in 2024 as well. But according to Russ, this will actually be coming to the iPads first. Now, it didn't really make sense initially, but apparently the reason for this is that iPads have a much lower pixel density or PPI. Um, and the first generation of those under the display cameras, uh, they actually need fairly large pixels on the display or a low PPI to be able to see through. On top of that, the iPad is also manufactured in much lower volume compared to the iPhone, especially the iPad Pro. So I guess it would also be much easier to source in that case. But I think the big question to me here is simply why? Like the iPad does not have a notch and the bezels are fairly thin. So why do we need an under the display face ID and camera? Are the bezels going to be getting even thinner or are we simply going to get a full screen iPad design in the future? And in that case, what about accidental touch rejection? Russ also gave us some updates on the foldable iPhone and apparently the main reason why Apple hasn't done anything yet is because they don't have sufficient volume of covered glass. That's the main reason. Now, you probably know that Samsung is the only manufacturer for these displays, and uh, Samsung also has their own line of foldable phones. So they need to use those displays for their own devices. If Apple were to release a foldable iPhone, that would sell probably way better than Samsung's own phones, so they would need significantly more affordable uh, panels, which they just cannot do at the moment. Now, I also think that the overall global interest in foldables has indeed dropped dramatically. Uh, I, I feel like the novelty of it has worn off quite a bit, but let me know if you agree or not. And I also want to touch on the Studio Display Pro a bit. So this is the one that is essentially a Studio Display, but with mini LED technology. And we also have some updates in terms of this from Ross Young. Some good news 
and some bad news. So the good news are that it will also have a 120Hz ProMotion display, which is awesome. But the bad news is that it's been delayed once again. So it was first supposed to come out in June, then that got delayed to October, and now this got delayed to apparently early 2023. Now, I'm personally super hyped for this monitor, uh, mostly in terms of the specs. Like, I would honestly get this and use it for like, I don't know, like eight years or something. Uh, it's way more future-proofed with mini LED and 120 hertz, but sadly, it is still only expected to be 27 inches in size. But what I'm definitely not excited for is the price. And this is said to be very, very expensive. The studio display costs $1,600, which is already very expensive. Like you can buy an OLED TV for that price. And this studio display pro will very likely be in between the studio display and the pro display XDR. So somewhere around $3,000. Yeah, I simply think that this would be just way too expensive and just not justifiable. Like you can buy Sony's new Inzone M9 monitor uh, for less than $1,000. And this monitor, guess what? It's a 4K, uh, 144 Hertz with mini LED technology. I also wanna to touch upon iOS 16 public beta. So you've probably seen that a lot of uh, reviewers uh, and also publications have started making videos and also releasing articles on iOS 16 as if it's new. Well, that's because the iOS 16 public beta is now out. And uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but in the developer beta, there is apparently uh, an NDA when you click agree to all terms, which no one reads, but apparently there's an NDA in there, uh, which states that you're not allowed to make content. Now, most publications uh, just ignore that or they're not even aware, so they still make content. Uh, some are aware of that, and uh, especially if they have a great relationship with Apple, they just wait until the public beta is out. You can download this one today. It's the same as the developer beta 3, which means fewer bugs, still a couple of left. Uh, so if you want to try it, go to Apple's public beta page and you can get it from there. And just one last thing on the Apple Watch. So according to Russ Young, Apple is not expecting a lot of sales for the Apple Watch Series 8, more specifically uh, on that Pro model. He says that this will be manufactured in fairly low volumes uh, because of the high price points. Apple's only expected to sell about 1 million units compared to 4 million of the regular Series 8, which seems to confirm Mark Gurman's report that it would be very pricey. By the way, in case you haven't seen our video on the Apple Watch Series 8 Pro, check it out right here. But yeah, let me know what do you guys think of all of these updates. Check out our Xenotech Shorts channel for quick and fun tech content. And um, we're actually hiring. So yeah, I'm hiring another video creative person. So that means editor and also cinematographer. You'll also be doing uh, thumbnails and a lot of cool things. So if you're interested in tech and you're also interested in video production, editing, filming, all of that, uh, there's an application form down below so you can apply. You need to be UK based and also uh, relocate or commute to where our office is in Salford, uh, Greater Manchester. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'm Daniel and I'll see you guys in the next one. So Tech, signing out. Cheers.